Here I have a 2016 MacBook Pro with a touch bar which I bought for only 300 bucks. That's a whole computer for a much lower price of a brand new iPhone, even the SE. But the question is, how capable is this laptop as of today? What can you do on an older MacBook? And where are its limits? Is $300 enough to get a good and reliable MacBook? Or do you almost have to get the newer M1 and M2 Mac computers? Well, let's find out. First off, we have to know what specs we're dealing with because this MacBook came with loads of different specs. Some of which made for rich people, unlike my broke ass. Then it's hard to guess that this is a base model MacBook Pro, but at least it's a 15 inch and not a 13 inch, making me LESS BROKE! Anyways, it's rocking a quad core 60 gen Intel Core i7 with 2.6 GHz, which get the job done, but isn't a powerhouse. However, it is capable of running all everyday applications such as Word, Discord, all the macOS programs, and some heavier applications, such as video and photo editing software. More on that in a bit. Alongside the CPU, it has 16GB of LPDDR3 RAM and 256GB of SSD storage which are permanently attached to the motherboard, meaning that you can't upgrade it after you bought it, which is a common Apple move and it really sucks. The SSD however has similar disk speeds to some of the latest base Macs, because on the newer Macs, Apple decided to ship out on the SSDs quite a bit. For the graphics, it has integrated Intel HD Graphics 530 for light to use and a dedicated AMD Radeon Pro 450 with 2GB of VRAM which the Mac will automatically switch to when doing more demanding tasks, such as video editing or playing games. Now, with these specs you are going to be limited to run applications that require more resources, but for the most part it's actually completely workable. The MacBook Pro 2016 was a significant release at the time, but it's no surprise that it falls short in the single and multi-core scores when compared to the newer M1 and M2 MacBook Pros as you can see in these benchmarks. Also this Mac has stopped receiving software updates and the highest official supported macOS is Monterey. You still can install newer softwares via OpenCore Legacy Patcher, but Monterey still feels snappy and have a modern look to it. Apple still releases security updates for Monterey and will probably continue to do so for the next couple of years, meaning it will still be relevant for quite some time. Speaking of longevity, my battery has 866 cycle counts and shows normal condition. I still get several hours of battery life when I don't push the Mac too hard and it can last up to a full workday. If you have an older MacBook, how does your battery life hold up? Let me know in the comments below. And before we go through what a day with this MacBook can be like, we have to discuss its groundbreaking design and features. <laughs> this was the first MacBook Pro that received a whole new and thinner design for the first time since the well-recognized 2012 Retina MacBook Pro. And I say this is one of the prettiest Mac models that exist, and it for sure still looks modern. Also, this design language is still being used in the 13-inch M1 and M2 MacBook Pros. And the only drawback from the design is the thick bezels, but to be honest, I don't mind them at all. Still, this is a 2880 by 1800 6Hz retina display with great colors and a maximum screen brightness of 500 nits, which works just fine. Well, except for using it in direct sunlight, as you can see here. But otherwise, this is a really nice display for the price, and the build quality is something you can't beat. If we move down to the bottom case, we have a massive force touch trackpad, and it's the same great trackpad found in the newer Max as well. You can click anywhere on the trackpad and it will simulate a click with haptics, which makes it an absolute blast to use. I love the haptic feedback on this trackpad, and thankfully it has great palm reaction so you can rest your palms on the trackpad without moving the cursor around. In other words, you can't find a better trackpad than this, especially for the low price of 300 bucks. But then we have the keyboard. Oh, the keyboard. This is the famous second gen butterfly keyboard that is known for having issues. When I bought it, the spacebar required f***ing immense power to press on it, so I simply grabbed a guitar pick and scraped underneath the key, and as simple as that I now have a fully functional butterfly keyboard. I've owned this MacBook for roughly 6 months now, and the keyboard haven't let me down since. I really love the large keys and the clicky sound that the keyboard provides. Now, this keyboard has really short key traveling, like really short, which I didn't like the first couple of days. But as time passed on, the keyboard really started to grow on me, 
Some people hate the keyboard, while others love it. So I guess you have to experience it yourself to know if you like the keyboard. I personally think the keyboard is alright, or in other words, the keyboard is <coughs> mid. But I strongly prefer the more recently Magic Keyboards. Anyway, have a quick listen to the keyboard. And of course, above the keyboard, we have the touch bar. The touch bar can improve the speed of having many different shortcuts with the touch of your fingertips. For instance, you can tap on suggested words, control your music, use powerful features in editing software, scroll through emojis, and you can even play games, memes, and skip YouTube ads. Although, don't skip it on my videos. Don't you dare. I need it on my and that's only some of the features. It might take some more milliseconds to adjust the screen brightness or the volume compared to doing it the traditional way. Not everyone is going to agree with me here, but I find it more fun and satisfying doing it on the touch bar. And when I use the Mac, I always integrate with the touch bar to speed up my workflow. Or not. <laughs> Whee! And we also have the Touch ID which you can use to unlock the Mac, pay online and use it to autofill passwords. It's super convenient to have it on a laptop and I absolutely love it. And that's not all. The speakers on this machine is still miles ahead the most out of today's Windows laptops. Take a quick listen. All of this tech crammed into this thin and portable computer gets me through the day just fine. The battery can last up to 6 hours at best, but when surfing the web or when using heavier applications I have to keep a charger close by. But keep in mind that this MacBook has a decently used battery, which is common to see when buying older used laptops. But on the other hand, the 2016 MacBook Pro was never a battery champion. Now, it's a really silent machine until you start playing games or of course when you run more demanding applications. While writing this script, the Mac is running on a cool 46 degrees celsius. Watching youtube videos only bumps it up to 55 degrees celsius. And after an extended period of editing in DaVinci Resolve, the Mac can hit up to 90 degrees and up to 100 degrees celsius when you play back a video. More specifically, a 1080p video. And this is around the same temp that the fan would start to ramp up to cool it down faster, which Macs are known for doing by now. But overall still decent cooling for a 2016 Macbook. It's not great but not bad at the same time. It handles everyday tasks surprisingly well and has enough horsepowers under the hood to use more professional apps, so they call it. And for the keyboard, it's not the best keyboard that Apple has made, but I don't mind it. So this MacBook only set me back 300 bucks. Usually I find these models for 500 bucks or more, and the reason that the price is much lower on this MacBook is that it has some cosmetic flaws. The first flaw is a non-working camera. The system isn't detecting a camera and I don't know what's causing the issue. Unfortunately the MacBook screws are f***ing special and I don't have the required tools for that. But when I do have the required tools or the screwdriver, whatever, I'll be sure to check out the motherboard. I fix it, please sponsor me. The second issue is the screen. A section of the screen has sort of a dark shadow on it. I believe it's moisture and it's relatively common on these models. But to be honest, it isn't disturbing at all. And for the most part, I can't even tell the difference on the screen. Yeah, it's whatever. But at the same time, this could also indicate that the screen is causing the camera issue instead of the motherboard. But as of right now, I can't open the damn thing. And the last issue is a little dent at the bottom of the case about the touch bar, along with signs of use all over the MacBook. But it isn't any severe damage and visually the computer still looks great. But why did I buy this laptop? Why this specific one? Especially when my PC is way more powerful and way more capable of running demanding applications. So, three reasons. One, I wanted to take my work and studies wherever I go. And this laptop is something that I can rely on for the next couple of years. Maybe except for the keyboard, but so far, no major issues. Two, the design. 
As I mentioned before, this is one of my favorite MacBook designs ever. It's thin, portable and looks modern. And number 3, I wanted to try out the Mac experience on a Mac that I could get at a bargain. And being deep into the Apple ecosystem, this Mac just works with all of my other devices. For instance, Apple Watch to unlock the MacBook, iPhone to browse the web and pick up on the MacBook, iPad to use as a second monitor via sidecar, and so on. To wrap up, the 15 inch MacBook Pro with touch bar is a solid choice for doing a variety of tasks. And this is thanks to its quad core CPU and not dual core found on the 13 inch models. Dedicated graphics card, which also isn't found on the 13 inch model. 16GB of RAM and 4 USB-C ports, although you have to prepare for dongles. And I really can't call it a pro laptop as of today, but it handles everyday tasks wonderfully and it can handle some demanding applications without major issues. So for a price point of around 300 bucks, it's a bargain, provided it's free of major issues of course. Now obviously the M1 and M2 Macs are way more capable than this Intel Mac, the cheapest Mac you can buy brand new is the M2 Mac Mini for $599 and $499 for education, making the Mac Mini a considerable choice due to how capable it is for the price. And if you want a MacBook, you have to spend the big bucks, unless you do like me and buy a used Intel MacBook. And with that, if you found this review interesting, don't forget to like and subscribe for more videos like this. And while you're at it, check out this cool video here on the left and leave your thoughts about this MacBook here in the comment section below. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video. It's blooper time. This Mac has stopped receiving software update. <laughs> and with that, if you found this review.